Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for Dismantling Racist Childcare Policies. Um, if you could all mute your mics, if you haven't already, that would be great, so we can all hear each other. Um, I'm going to start off with, um, with my value statement about childcare. I believe every child deserves to grow up in a loving, enriching, warm environment and that every parent deserves to provide for their family with respect and dignity. My name is Lori Furstenfeld, and I work at the Child Care Law Center, and I'm joined by my colleague, Keisha Nzewe, from the California Child Care Resource and Referral Network. We will take you through the roots of child care history, and we will be very general, in our, in our summation of the racist roots of child care policies in the United States. And then we will walk you through this process and take you to the impacts of today. And we will start with Keisha. Next slide, please. Good morning, everybody. It's great to see one, two, three, four, four people across the bottom of my screen that I can see. And eventually I'll probably scroll and see all who is here. Um, so how did we get to this moment? 2020 started off with COVID, of course, but it also started off with um, what we came to get used to is the state sanctioning murder of black people over and over again. And then in June, we actually witnessed um, the, the, the brutal murder of George Floyd. Um, and at that moment, um, and ever since, if you were on the um, Dr. Pickens opening um, remarks this morning, at that moment, I feel a lot of us um, embraced our own psychological bravery. It allowed people to stop being quiet and to speak up um, against racism. Um, for childcare in California, we've made a lot of remarkable strides just in the short time that I've been at the network. It's been four years now. But we've achieved 12-month eligibility where parents are required to only report if their income exceeds 85% of the state median income. Um, for CalWORK Stage 1, parents receive child care um, immediately, and they can't be put on a waiting list. Um, as of January 1st of this year, um, in a bill that Lori spearheaded at the 234 and that we co-sponsored with the Child Care Law Center, um, family child care providers who are mainly women and women of color and immigrants cannot be required to get a zoning permit or a business license just to open their small family child care home or large. And they can do now explicitly um, if those rights are violated. But we still have a lot of work to dismantle policies that are harming families and start anew. Um, we have to come face to face and call out the policies that are racist in nature. We need to dig deep. We're going to have uncomfortable conversations, analyze and understand the roots of these policies, name them for what they are, and then we hope that next year, or starting now, but as we move into a new legislative year, we explain to our policymakers why they are unjust, we eradicate them, and create equitable, in fact, not equitable, anti-racist child care policies that support families. Next slide. I think that it's really important to start with what is, um, the roots of our child care policies and start with a really basic understanding of what race means. Um, so race is a social construct. It's not based on biology. And before the 1500s, the term race was really used infrequently. And it was used to identify people with a kinship or group connection. And then the meaning of race took on a whole new meaning with the colonization of what is now the United States ever since. So in the 19th century, European philosophers 
they move toward categorizing their understanding of the world um, based on rational, secular reasoning rather than religion. And they also categorized um, their understanding of the world um, as it applied to humans. And so as white people colonized other um, continents around the world, they brought their ideas and philosophies with them. And Europeans used their categoriza categorization to justify their colonization and new hierarchy um, based on race to justify their enslavement of indigenous people and Africans. And this new construct of race united white people in their oppression of non-white people. So as you can see, tragically, our US culture from the very beginning developed around the ideas of race and racism and the justification of instituting this hierarchy of people. Today, race is largely defined on where you live and who you're talking to. But generally speaking in the United States, race is used to um, describe people based on the color of their skin and um, sometimes other physical characteristics such as hair, um, the shape of one's eyes and their height. And though these physical differences may appear to be distinguishable, they're determined only by a minute portion of our DNA. In fact, all of us, we share about 99.9% .9 of the same DNA and reputable um, scientific research has yet to find any evidence of genetic differences when it comes to intelligence. So importantly, the biological difference between different and ancestral populations are really few and superficial. By um, the 19th century, after the official end of formal slavery, the race ideology as we know it today fully emerged as a new mechanism to divide and stratify people. So now um, we're on to the definition of what is racism. When you look up racism in most dictionaries, it offers a very basic definition and doesn't really speak to the social impacts of how racism affects all of us. And so we really liked this definition that was offered by an organization called Dismil Dismantling Racism Works. It's defined as involving one group of people having the power to carry out systemic discrimination through the institutional policies and practices of the society and by shaping the cultural beliefs and values that support those racist policies and practices. And one thing that I would add to this definition is that racism benefits the group at the top of the hierarchical structure at the expense of people who are below. And in this country, it's mostly white people who are benefiting at the expense of non-white people. Next slide, please. So briefly, we wanted to make sure you understand that we are talking about, in, in, in the context today, we're talking about systemic and structural racism versus interpersonal racism. So the term institutional racism was coined by Stokely and Carmichael in 1967, and it's described as a form of racism that is embedded, that is embedded in our everyday practices in society. It's how racist and discriminatory practices of institutions intersect to create a network of opportunity for people in the white group while blocking opportunity and access for communities of color. Next slide, please. So as, as Stokely Carmichael said, when white terrorists bomb a black church and kill five black children, that is an act of individual racism, widely deplored by most segments of the society. But when in that same city, Birmingham, Alabama, 500 black babies die each year because of the lack of proper food, shelter, and medical facilities, and thousands more are destroyed and maimed physically, emotionally, and intellectually because of conditions of poverty and discrimination in the black community. That is a function of institutional racism. So um, we're gonna start back now with um, 
go back way in history um, with when so-called domestic work first started. Um, so when we dig further, the further we dug <laughs> into the history of our child care policies to understand how they evolved and got us to this current place, we arrived at the birth of our nation. And this took us to slavery. People who live here in the U.S. have inherited this legacy of how race and racism originated and has been constructed in this country. We could spend days, in fact, even years on this part of our history, but we'll be, try to be brief. So historical records show that Africans were brought to this country as early as 1513, <laughs> and while at the same time, indigenous people were also enslaved by settlers. 1619 was a pivotal turning point with the introduction of the transatlantic slave trade. Black people were stolen from their land and forced violently into unpaid labor. White people owned and controlled black bodies and families, ultimately controlling their destiny. During slavery, black families were torn apart. Black women were forced to care for their master's children while their own children were sold or forced to work alongside their mothers. From the start of colonization in this country, it was normalized by the dominant white culture for black children to be separated from their parents while white children <coughs> were cared for in their homes. The role of black women as domestic workers, which included the care for others' children, dates back to slavery. As you all know, women were not paid for their work. In fact, they were usually tortured and raped under these conditions. And white male lawmakers categorized black women, men, and children as property. And this became the supreme law with Dred Scott decision as justification not to end slavery. Next slide, please. At the same time, there was there was a parallel movement um, in the North for childcare. Throughout the 19th and 20th centuries, there were two tracks of childcare that started to emerge. There was one system that was rooted in social welfare with little attention to child development. And then there was another track that was rooted in education that was mainly geared for middle and upper class families. Now, in 1828, the infant schools started to emerge in Boston and the, and the neighboring northern states, and they were geared toward addressing the cycle of poverty. Um, and at this time, poverty was viewed as a spiritual problem and not identified as an economic or racist one. And one of the main hopes of the infant schools was that morality would be taught in these um, care in the care of these women and that it would permeate these moral these morals would permeate into the children's homes um so that quote unquote poor people would learn how to be better citizens in society the infants and then um at the same time the infant schools took on with the white middle class to upper class families with an emphasis on enrichment and not teaching these same morals. The infant school era was short lived and it started to die in 1832 with the advent of um, primary education and kindergarten and a, more of a push to keep children at home with their mothers. Next slide, please. Now, after formal slavery was abolished, whites in the South organized to reject the Reconstruction um, with Jim Crow laws and policies to legalize segregation and continue the legacy of slavery. Even the 13th Amendment includes a loophole, which says no slavery or involuntary servitude is permissible except for punishment for a crime where one has been duly convicted the beginning of our modern day prison system. Local state laws and policies were created through intimidation and violence, affecting all of our community systems, schools, public transportation, job, housing, and of course, childcare. Next slide, please. The day nurseries began to emerge in response to more parents, especially women who were poor, um, who needed to work. And there was this push for the need to save children again from poverty 
And from being left alone, do we see the emergence of Sunday school, missions, orphanages, kindergarten education? We also see that day nurseries came with a wide range of services and quality. Some were very basic, and there were maybe 20 to 50 children cared for at a time with very meager meals. And then there were others that had much smaller ratios and offered instruction to children, job search for mothers, and a lot more supportive services. In 1903, Black women opened the first day nursery for Black children because many times they were excluded from being able to use the same care as the white families. But day nurseries, as much of a support they were for working, mostly working women, they also had a lot of stigma attached to them, even by the women who helped establish them. So for example, Grace Abbott, who is a well-known social worker from the early 19 hundreds and was the director of the child labor division of the U.S. Children's Bureau from 1917 to 1919. She asserted that day nurseries were not a necessary part of child welfare services and that the nation could well afford to support mothers staying at home. So while we see white women activists from a very early time passing judgment on women who must work, um, mainly black and brown women, and aspiring to an ideal standard where women can stay at home with their children, an option that was not often and still not often available um, to many black and brown women. Next slide, please. So post-slavery, um, up until World War I, Black women and Black people primarily took the roles of domestic or agricultural workers, Black women primarily as domestic workers. Um, and in white families' homes, and this was throughout the country, not just in the South, it was both in the South and the North, um, it, even into the beginning of the 20th century. Next slide. Let's move on to the New Deal of the 1930s. We're on, um, so, the New Deal was a series of programs, financial reforms, laws that were enacted by President Roosevelt between 1933 and 1939 um, as, as a response to the Great Depression. And so with that came a lot of new labor laws, many of them the first of their kind. <laughs> so in 1933, um, Congress earmarked $6 million to establish emergency nursery schools. And that was to employ unemployed teachers, custodians, and nurses. That was the primary purpose. But the secondary purpose was to promote the physical and mental well-being of preschool children from needy, underprivileged families. Any child between the ages of two and five whose family was on release was eligible to attend the emergency nursery school. So in this case, they're viewed as a response to an economic crisis. For a limited time during crisis, the federal government provides relatively small, temporary, though innovative relief programs serving children and unemployed workers. The narrow scope, uneven quality, and limited availability of health, nutrition, and childcare services of the emergency nursery school schools again reflects the nation's ambivalent attitudes toward people who live in poverty and government-supported childcare outside of the home. Now, these programs ended with the start of World War II. Next slide. There, the New Deal labor laws excluded domestic and agricultural workers because those workers, again, were primarily black. But it was amended in 1974 to include domestic work, but with, with limitations. No overtime. Babysitters were excluded from overtime and minimum wage and employees providing companionship services for individuals because they are unable to care for themselves were excluded for overtime pay and minimum wage. Next slide. Back to World War II. So on June 29, 1943, the Senate passed the first and that's only, only, that's our only <coughs> national child care program voting 20 million dollars to provide public child care of children whose mothers were employed for the duration of World War II. 
So we spent in between 1943 and 46, we spent $52 million um, to open 3,000 federally funded child care. And in 1942, we um, emergency child care centers were established to support working mothers in order to win the war. So again, in time of emergency, when white families are at risk, many white women needed to work for the first time, and so they needed childcare. Next slide. So World War II ended, and so did federally funded childcare. Um, so huge protests from individuals and in states at the war, as the war was dwindled down in 1945 to maintain the funding for childcare. So it was extended until February of 1946. Now, in the past, the U.S. government had only supported child care to support the education of children from families with low incomes or to ensure poor women would work. The land -hand program, up to date, the only time in U.S. history when parents could send their children to federally subsidized child care, regardless of income, and do so affordably. <laughs> Under it all, families, all families, regardless of income, were eligible for child care for up to six days a week including summers and holidays, and parents paid the equivalent of $9 to $10 a day by today's economic standards. Um, Chris Herbst, who researched the long-run outcomes of Lanham Act child care program, found a substantial increase in mothers working, including five years after the program ended. But until white middle-class women needed child care while their husbands were away during the war effort, child care was frowned upon and had the stigma of only poor women needing it. But most women, black women, had always had to work and long needed childcare in order to do so. But during World War II, in response to white families' need for care, the federal government stepped in to provide childcare to every working mother who needed it. Next slide. So I bring in the GI Bill because this, this leads to a lot of the um, institutional racism that, that harms the, the wealth and educational attainment of black families. So the GI Bill um, excluded one million black veterans, even though they should have, been, they should have qualified. Um, it provided low-cost mortgages, low-cost interest loans, unemployment, and education. But from the start, but it was only to veterans who had a honorable discharge, um, but not if you had uh, anything other than an honorable discharge. So from the start, black veterans uh, were at a disadvantage because they were much more likely than white veterans to be dishonorably discharged. Veterans who did qualify couldn't find facilities that delivered on the bill's promise. Um, uh, black veterans in a vocational training in Indianapolis couldn't participate <coughs> because they were segregated, so they couldn't take the training on an electrician plumbing or printing. And then simple intimidation kept others from utilizing the bill. In 1947, a crowd hurled rocks at black veterans as they moved into a Chicago housing development. And thousands of veterans were attacked in the years following World War II, and some were even lynched. <laughs> so these exclusions limited black families' ability to purchase homes, which leads to generational wealth or obtain college degrees or vocational certificates that for white people were passed for to the American dream. Again, it's okay for the government to fund the lives of white people, but not black. Next slide, please. So in the background of, throughout our history, there's always been pushback mainly from black and brown people, some white allies against these oppressive policies. And in the 1960s, this pushback came to a head um, with the 1960s civil rights movement. And the Head Start Act was passed in 1964. It was, it was born um, at another time in our history where there was a sense of emergency. There was a fight for social justice and an aim to make um, more equitable policies in childcare. It's, it started as an eight week summer camp for children to get a head start for elementary school and to end the cycle of poverty. That was the aim of the program. 
And it was a comprehensive program that met the emotional, that was intended to meet the emotional health, nutritional and health needs of children and families. By 1966, it was extended into a full day program for the school year. And since it has extended in many other aspects to include women who are pregnant, to um, address the cultural and linguistic needs of families. So over time, Head Start has really evolved to, um, to respond to the needs of families. In 1970, um, a policy emerged where, um, where that included parents in the decision-making process. Uh, Head Start created local committees so that parents would have a say in the policies. And interestingly, many Head Start grantees threatened to leave the program because they felt like this authority given to parents who were mainly black and brown gave them too much power. We go into the 1980s where there is a long debate about whether to extend continuity of care to families or to serve more families without more funding, a debate that persists today. And so the program chooses to serve more children for multiple years with the Human Services Reauthorization Act of 1986. Next slide, please. There was an interesting moment in our history, 1971, 1972, with the Child Development Bill. It was the first step toward universal child care. And the aim was to provide a multi-billion dollar bill to provide universal child care with comprehensive services on a national scale. It had overwhelming support, 63 to 17, but unfortunately, President Nixon vetoed the bill and his stated reasons where um, he was worried about the communal approach to child rearing. Uh, which stemmed from the fear of communism. He didn't want child care to look like it did in Russia. And he also stated that it would be a family weakening policy, meaning, as we know, um, the fear of weakening the white family, because since slavery and um, now many other people of color, we have many other people in our country at this point, um, and immigrants, and um, he he is fearful that it's going to weaken the white family. But as we know, many of these other women were already working. Next slide, please. So we move into the era of the welfare queen myth. Um, this is Linda Taylor. She is the original quote unquote welfare queen that Ronald Reagan um, and others like him loved to tell the story of untruthfully. Um, it's, the Wealth Fair Queen stands for the myth that the idea that black people are too lazy to work and instead of, um, instead of relying on public benefits to get by, um, which is paid for the rest of us, the rest of upstanding citizens. Um, the myth is that she's promiscuous, having as many children as possible in order to beef up her benefit take. <laughs> but it was always a myth white people have always made up the majority of those receiving government checks. And if anything, the benefits are too miserly, not too lavish. But it's a potent stereotype, which helps fuel a crackdown on the poor and a huge reduction in their benefits, and it remains powerful today. Um, let's watch a brief video about Linda Taylor. In 1976, when Ronald Reagan pursued the Republican presidential nomination, he repeatedly told the story of an African-American woman named Linda Taylor, claiming she was earning more than $150,000 a year by cheating social service, holding her up as an example of liberal policies gone wrong. I think that's pretty difficult The story grabbed attention but had little basis in reality. Taylor was a con artist and not at all representative of the typical welfare recipient. 
The welfare queen image is a manufacturer of Ronald Reagan and the Republican Party using one, one, only one story from Chicago in the 1970s of one woman who scammed something from the system. And it's not entirely clear all that she scammed. There's this notion that 99% of the welfare money in this society is going to black and Hispanics. It's wrong. It's bogus. Because the majority of people on welfare are white. The majority of people on food stamps are white. Reagan's attack on welfare marked a significant change. Since the Great Depression, the federal government had offered aid to poor people, the majority of whom were white. Now, in financially insecure times, Reagan hinted that those programs, paid for by tax dollars, were only aiding black people. And he promised that cutting them would help fix the economy. This is a turning point, not only in the history of black people, but it's a turning point in the ways in which people can talk about poverty. Because uh, we've moved from this idea of the deserving poor to the undeserving poor. And it's very much a kind of uh, emphasis upon uh, morality and moralism and all these kinds of things that uh, are much more invested in the idea of individual failure than asking how did we wind up with this population of impoverished people in the first place. So in the end, it was the Cook County where Taylor lived. Um, spent $50,000 to convict her in order to recover $8,865.67. Next slide. You can see our child care policies in large part have been built on the legacy of racism that dates back to slavery. We see it in large part um, in our policies with the fraud prevention provisions, the requirements to sign forms under penalty of perjuries, which subject parents and providers to civil and criminal charges. And child care and work responsibility work rules are codified and they serve as the blueprint to dehumanize black women and men and to suppress their wages and continue this legacy. You see it in the Family Support Act of 1988 with really strongly defined work requirements on that district, what kinds of jobs and how hours one must work. And then on to the CCDBG Act that was first passed in 1990, on to the 1996 amendments and reauthorization of the Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Act, commonly known as welfare reform, where stronger work requirements are implemented and more policies regarding um, time limits and um, penalty of perjury language in our policies emerge. And then we move on to the reauthorization of CCDBG in 2014, where there were many improvements and there was more of a focus on the well-being of children in the, in the reauthorization in 2014 but we still see a legacy of many of the old policies that have been carried out with examples of late payments to providers, again, the signing of forms under penalty of perjury, the requirement, for example, where contractors must speak to an employer, a parent's employer, to verify that they are in fact employed when there's other ways of verifying that. Next slide, please. So this is a real example of the impacts of the racist policies in childcare. We see it in the suppression of childcare wages. The median national wage for an early childhood education worker is $12.12, and black women still today make 78 cents per dollar who are ECE workers. And the younger the childcare, the younger the child in childcare, the lower the wages are. Next slide, please.
So Lori's mentioned uh, many of the, the child care policies um, where we find the evidence of the racist roots of child care. Um, so on this slide, you'll see examples of them, family fees, um, QRIS, we will have a whole session on that tomorrow. I hope you'll join. Um, as Lori just said, penalty of perjury signature requirement. Um, that if, if you're signing this, most parents are signing something to the best of their knowledge, but that there's this threat hanging over them um, if, 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 in fact, there's a mistake. Family child care providers themselves being ineligible for state-administered child care. They can't receive the child care support or child care subsidy. Um, again, low wages. Child care they began with no wages with enslaved black women who were forced to care for the children of their enslavers, their white enslavers. And that legacy is seen through the low wages and the undervaluing of, of domestic work. Um, parents have to agree that the um, that if their subsidy provider speaks with their employer instead of just providing in so many other systems where we maybe just provide a paycheck stub. Um, your employer doesn't have to be called and all up in, in your business. Um, in communities, low-income communities, which are most likely communities of color, black, indigenous, people of color, um, the regional market rate is suppressed because it's based on what people can afford, what the market will allow. And so they will always be underpaid. Insufficient funding, because that's how we devalue the system of child care. Um, and then during the COVID-19 rule, family child care providers um, had to absorb the cost of family fees for children who were staying at home. Um, and then they, they could still be paid for those staying at home. <laughs> but how to show that they attempted to receive a signature from their parents. Um, so those are just examples. We would love to hear from you. Next slide. We would love to hear from you, any thoughts or feelings or reflections on everything we said, but especially around policies that you see that may be unfair or rooted in racism. Um, in our in our childcare system in California or federally, and you can do it in chat, but you can also um, unmute yourself and just talk. Hello. Go ahead. Hi, I have a just a question. Um, with some of the, the last slide where you were showing some of the um, racist child care policies, and we know that many of them may not be totally eliminated, what are some of the solutions or suggestions to make those programs better and meet the needs of our community better? Max, can you go back to the slide, um, back one slide? <coughs> yeah, right there. Um, most of these, we would just eliminate the requirement. Would you agree, Lori? Uh, wait, everyone's frozen for me. I don't know if you can oh. hear me, but I can. Sorry, I was, <laughs> I was trying to unmute. Um, yes, I, our aim here is to really eliminate the stigma of child care to eliminate the racist policies in childcare and to make access as easy as possible for families. And so with family fees, for example, we see this as a way of people of color, mostly women, who are subsidizing other people of color who also have low incomes, childcare workers. And so we see the solution here is fully funding childcare. We need to reevaluate our values in the state in this country and put more money into child care and not have, we shouldn't have to choose between continuity of care and how many families we serve. We see the real aim here is universal child care and um, really making a system that is not racist. And a lot of that requires money. 
um, I would say, for example, the penalty of perjury signature requirement, there's other ways of asking people to tell the truth without subjecting them to civil and criminal charges. And so you say, for example, to the best of my knowledge, I believe everything and all the information I've provided in this document to be true and accurate. So that's that's one example. Um, Keisha, do you have any other examples besides? Um, I think Keisha's right is just eliminating a lot of these. These. Um, so I'm answering a question in chat, which I will also verbalize <laughs> in a moment. Um, but. Um, Okay, wait, I'm still typing Stacy Hudson. Okay, thanks for the question. So, um, yes, the slides will be available. I'm not sure where or how, but I know we'll get instructions on that for all of us attending the conference. I think, so, I think for all of these, it's a matter of eliminating. They are all, all of these policies are possible um, because of everything that happened until the moment, especially of welfare reform, is that it's, it's based on the, the myth of black people being lazy, black people being undeserving, not, black people not being able to take care of their children, um, and that trickles down to every other person who is not white, um, then we, we just have to just get rid of all of these policies. They're not, they are not there um, to support families or to support children. They're there because we think, all, we thought all of those things about black people in the past. Um, yeah. And so I think a lot of it though has, um, while especially the contractor, um, our organizations are required to do these things I think it's also a matter of how you approach them without that assumption of fraud. You know, approach people as people. I know that I have to do this, but I'm trying to work to get rid of it. Um, yeah, so I hope that helps. Um, the, okay, the question I was answering, and then there's, there's, there's another question too. Okay. Um, why is there still a wage gap between white providers and providers of color? And I, um, I answered because usually the closer the provider is to actual working with children, the less money they make. And also, the younger the child, the less to pay. And so how that might play out, and I use the child care center as an example, is the teacher may be white, but the aides are not white. And so those aides make less than the teacher um, and receive lower pay. Also, family child care providers are more likely to care for infants and toddlers. And so, the, as I said, the younger the child, the lesser the pay. Um, I see the comment in the chat. Yeah, so to what, I, to, to what I was saying is that, like, you're forced to enforce these policies um, and so it makes it hard. And so Claudia is saying something that's been really helpful for her is acknowledging that it can be intimidating and time-consuming process. I think acknowledging to the family that she's helping, but that she'd be there in partnership to support them every step of the way. And so she and she is right. And what we're, we know that you are um, that these policies are in place, and so they have to be enforced at the moment. And so by Mitigating the harm that they do as much as possible um, is, is the best we can do at the moment until we fight from now, from this day forward to get rid of them. Um, Lori, there's a comment, the under penalty of perjury signature requirement, in my opinion, is saying essentially that their signature isn't enough um, in addition to the criminal charge implication. Change on a state level would need to take place. Is that correct? And how could this be done and how can we help get it done? Yes, yeah, so from my research, there's very few, I think there's two instances in our child care laws in this state that require penalty of perjury um, authorization. 
it's really in our regulations mostly embedded in our Title V regulations where you see penalty of perjury um, requirements. There are Give one example, for example, in SB 820 in the Budget Act, there's this requirement where uh, family child care providers can submit attendance records without a parent's signature and still get reimbursed. Um, they have to actually attempt to try to get the signature. They have to document their attempts to try to get the signature, even though they will get paid regardless. So it's like there's this unnecessary policing. And in the management bulletin, it says that parents or providers must sign this under penalty of perjury. This language is not in the act, but this is just one illustration of the carrying out of policies because it's so embedded in our systems that extra language that subjects providers to civil and criminal charges unnecessarily, it's not re even required by the law, but it's required by the policy that's being carried out. So that's just one example. Um, even the CDBG Act, I don't see any penalty of perjury language in that either. So I think it's a matter of changing our culture and um, elevating these issues to our lawmakers and to the administrators of childcare, and highlighting that we we don't need we don't need this language in our in our policies. Jennifer says we must trust families. <laughs> we should in every way. <laughs> um, and yeah, okay. Danielle says in my observation, in some cases, providers of color support parents of color who live in poverty, work long hours and on weekends. And I would add to that, they are, and we're we're. We have created a system where the poor are subsidizing the poor, where struggling child care providers, they're not turning away any family, they're not not giving them care even if they're not getting paid um, because that's just the nature of the type of people who go into this work and into family, home-based care especially. And so she continues, if they're not paying it for it themselves, they cannot afford to pay more, especially if they have multiple children. Um, Dominica provides more examples, not requiring providers to do additional work labor or labor for receiving incentives. Um, in any other field, they would be compensated for that. And I think uh, in this context, you might be talking about um, SIP. Um, she co-signs me, and then <laughs> our system chooses to validate or often shame parental choices as well. Think FFN, for example. <coughs> and Shelby, Shelby mentioned something that has come up um, before. It seems to me that racism as a parent and the segregation between children in state preschool, Head Start, and fee-based programs. And this is especially problematic considering how limited the hours are in the fully funded programs. Yeah, and Stacy provides another example. I'll, I'll add to that. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to note um, regarding Head Start, there's so many great um, aspects about Head Start, and Shelby is correct that it is limited. Unfortunately, so many families cannot access Head Start because of the hours and the limitations of um, availability. And also, for for example, for the way our law is written in California, that parents who have CalWORKs, who wish, you know, they have to weigh out leaving CalWORKs and using Head Start childcare because once you leave CalWORKs, you can't transition from stage two to stage three. And so um, sometimes parents have to make that choice. So that's just another example of a policy that we can change. No one's going to say I'm on mute. <laughs> I'm like, only if you can see my hands talking. 
Um, I was just saying that <coughs> Stacy was saying that um, in response to family child care providers so being so supportive of the families that they care for, um, that they have a religious-based program that does the same, that not only um, works out flexible payments for families who are struggling, but makes sure they have enough food to eat. Um, but they also can't afford to pay their child care staff livable wages, so their staff would be those same um, struggling families. And yes, Max, you can stop sharing your screen. <laughs> Um, let's see. <laughs> Jennifer, parents and, says, parents and providers are the best people to provide the solutions to barriers that we face. They must have a seat at the table, absolutely. Um, yeah, and Dominica brings up the issue of um, we have the potential to create supportive programs for FFN um, because of CCDBG, but with a new um, requirement of license exempt provider monitoring, that puts like policing back into the conversation. And FFN providers may often, again, be um, people who aren't white more often um, in the subsidy system. And it's another example of where we continue to police the bodies of black people. Um, oh, Nadir, uh, Nadir asked, can we go back to the last slide? And I think you mean the one with all of the, with all of the policies listed. Um, and Susan um, says, also affirms that the closer, Susan is established, is a researcher at CCRC, um, says that the provider affirms that um, provider pay being lower the closer you are to the child is supported by research from NSECE. And it's definitely a national I issue. It's not, most every one of the issues that we bring up are not unique to California. Um, it, 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 they exist because of federal policy. And yes, federal, FFN providers are paid the least of most, of all providers, in fact, um, they're, they're, they are paid shameful, shameful, shameful wages. And I'd like to add to that, that over half of family child care providers qualify for some sort of public assistance themselves, yet our child care policies exclude them from qualifying for child care and for state-administered child care themselves, and their assistants must jump through extra hoops to prove that they also need child care. So we have this assumption that um, family child care providers who are mostly black and brown women and immigrant women, and they don't need child care. Well, because the assumption is that they work at home, they should have their own children at home as well. We have five more minutes. Um, any other questions or comments? Um, we will get into the QRS discussion tomorrow, so I hope you join it. I think it might be at the same time, but I honestly can't remember. Um, good point, Stacey. <coughs> Having their children at home impacts their ratio, which then lowers their income because they can't care for other children. Lori, what do you hope um, folks leave here today with or doing? Like, I feel like after presence, after getting knowledge like this, it may feel a little helpless or a little, like, heavy. How would you hope we leave? hope that you share what we've um, shared with all of you, with your colleagues, and that this motivates you for change. I think we're at a real time in history and at a really critical moment with so much going on in our world that this is a real opportunity for change and improvement. And 
um, not to focus so much on fixing the system, but dismantling and eliminating policies that are hurting families and starting anew. And really we encourage you to think about how we can start anew and joining the fellow child care advocates in this fight for, um, for a child care system that does not have um, anti-black and racist policies. And I totally agree. And Disa says um, it has to happen at all levels, dismantling racism. Um, we can all start where we are. And so that's what I would, I would say, is if you feel inspired today, like you may not be able to change these bigger policies right now, how you, how you do your work um, today or tomorrow or next week, but by opening up that conversation, the conversation within your own organization um, and in joining our conversations um, in, at the bigger level uh, in our policy advocacy, um, we can really make true change. I feel like we just have to grasp this moment in time. It's one that we haven't experienced, most of us, um, in our lifetimes, um, and we can't let it go by without taking advantage of, of this opportunity for what I think is true substantial change. Um, Lisa goes on to say, we, if each of us examines the programs we conduct and talk with our colleagues about where racism is entrenched and perpetuated, we can begin to break it down. And I would say that this is where <laughs> that psychological bravery really comes into place, where it may be hard to bring these up, especially if you feel like you're alone, but like I said, this moment in time has made it possible because more and more people are speaking up and so you don't have to feel alone. And there's way more people than we could have ever imagined that have your back um, in speaking up for these injustices. Um, let's see, lots of good, it is, okay. But it's like so much typing happens in like one minute. Um, so you should, you should all be in the chat. Yeah, Lucy, I see that comment, and I can't comment yet, but that hers is around a system that doesn't work for people who don't speak English, um, and that's another huge, yes. We will get to keep the chat, though. Um, yes, Jennifer, we can't do better until we do better, and we can't change anything if we keep doing things the same way. Otherwise, it just stays the same. So. Uh, we have, it's 12, 14, so you have like less than a minute. I mean, closing, I gave my closing words of wisdom. Oh, just so my cough, it is not COVID, post nasal drip, caused by allergies. I actually did really good today getting through <laughs> this session, so. Um, yeah, and that's, uh, Carmen says, start with your workplace. A shift in your own policies. To educate and re-educate staff. Cool. All right. Um, that's it for today. This this is recorded. It's available for the next two weeks, so you can share it. Well, I don't know how you can share it, but it's it's visible for the next two weeks. Um, so hopefully your coworkers can log in and watch it. So thank you all. Thank you all for joining us today. It was well over a hundred of you. Almost hundred thirty at some point. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank you.